Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic, we're going to introduce the imaginary unit J. So in this topic, we will provide the justification for using this interesting object called the imaginary unit J, which is by definition the square root of negative 1. Now, by definition, the square root of x is a number such that that number squared is equal to x. Now, recall also that 2 times, uh, sorry, the square root of 2x is equal to the square root of 2 times the square root of x because 2 is greater than or equal to 0. And if we now square the square root of 2 times the square root of x, we get the square root of 2 squared times the square root of x squared. The first is 2, the second is x, so that is equal to 2x. So yes, the square root of 2x is equal to the square root of 2 times the square root of x. Consequently, if we have any value of c that is greater than or equal to 0, then we can always write the square root of c times x as the square root of c times the square root of x. Now, we're going to see that it, this is not true if we are dealing with anything that is not 0 or not a positive real number. For example, consider this. 1 is equal to the square root of 1, but 1 is equal to negative 1 times negative 1. However, the square root of negative 1 times negative 1 is not equal to the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, which is the square root of negative 1 squared, which should be negative 1. All right? So we can only separate a product under the square root if one of the two terms is positive or zero. Consequently, note that we theoretically have the following. We have the square root of negative 4, which is equal to the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1, which is equal to 2 times the square root of negative 1. All right, that makes sense. Now, Suppose that we just assume the square root of negative 1 is indeed an appropriate value so that the square root of negative 1 all squared is equal to negative 1. All right. We also note, therefore, that if we square negative the square root of 1, that gives us negative 1 squared times the square root of negative 1 all squared. Negative 1 squared is equal to 1 and the square root of negative 1 squared is negative 1. So this is 1 times... Oh, that's just negative 1. Okay, so if the square root of negative 1 squared is equal to negative 1, so is negative the square root of negative 1. All right. Okay, so now we know we can have this product beta times the square root of negative 1, where beta is any real number. Could we add to this a real number alpha? That is, could we have something of the form alpha, where alpha is real, plus beta times the square root of negative 1? Well, not sure why not. After all, given any variable x, we can always add alpha to beta times x. So that's what we're doing here. The only difference here is that x now is the square root of negative 1. Thus, we could actually square alpha plus beta times the square root of negative 1 using FOIL, the rule you learned in secondary school. First, outside, inside, last. So first, we multiply alpha times alpha to get alpha squared. Then we multiply alpha times beta beta times the square root of negative 1, which is just alpha beta times the square root of negative 1, because we're just multiplying the two real numbers. 
Uh, inside is beta times the square root of negative 1 times alpha, which is more or less the same thing. And we're left with beta times the square root of negative 1 all squared. All right. Now, the second and third terms are identical. And beta times the square root of negative 1 is just beta squared times the square root of negative 1 squared. But the square root of negative 1 squared is negative 1. So what we get here is alpha squared plus negative beta squared because we negated the beta squared because the square root of negative 1 squared was negative 1. And to this we add 2 times alpha beta times the square root of negative 1. All right, so this is more or less the same as what you saw in secondary school. Now, consider the polynomial z squared plus 1. Let us substitute into this polynomial the value z is equal to the square root of negative 1. Well, therefore we get the square root of negative 1 squared plus 1. That's equal to negative 1 plus 1, which is equal to 0. Oh, wait a second. Does this not mean that the square root of negative 1 is a root of this particular polynomial? Next, let's consider the polynomial z squared plus 2z plus 5. From secondary school, you know that this polynomial also does not have any real roots. Let's substitute into this polynomial this number here. Negative 1 plus 2 times the square root of negative 1. All right, so if we make this substitution, then to calculate the quadratic, we would use FOIL again. So that would be negative 1 times negative 1, or negative 1 squared. Negative 1 times 2 times the square root of negative 1. And then we would do 2 times the square root of negative 1, all times negative 1. So we've just essentially done that twice. And then we have 2 times the square root of negative 1 all squared. In the second term, we just have negative 2 plus 4 times the square root of negative 1, and then we have a plus 5 at the end. Now, negative 1 squared is just 1. Uh, 2 times negative 1 times 2 times the square root of negative 1 is just negative 4 times the square root of negative 1. And 2 times the square root of negative 1 squared is just 2 squared times negative 1 squared. Negative 1 squared is negative 1. And so that's just 4 times negative 1. And the rest is more or less the same, unchanged. OK, so if we simplify this and just collect those terms that are purely real and those terms that are multiplied by the square root of negative 1, you'll notice that, oh, wait a second, 1 minus 4 minus 2 plus 5 is 0, and the next two terms seem to cancel out. So that's equal to 0. So it seems that this z is also a root of z squared plus 2z plus 5. Now, what does the quadratic formula give for the roots of the polynomial z squared plus 1? Well, given the polynomial a times z squared plus b times z plus c, you know that the quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. OK. Well, let's substitute those values into the quadratic formula. And simplifying this, we get that the roots are plus or minus the square root of negative 4 all over 2. But we can write the square root of negative 4 as the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1. And the square root of 4 is 2, and so the numerator and denominator cancel. And so we're left with the roots being plus or minus the square root of negative 1.
Okay, nice. That's what we substituted in, and at least we substituted in one of those two, and we saw that it was indeed a root. Now, does the quadratic formula give the same roots for z squared plus 2z plus 5? Well, if we plug in those values into the quadratic formula, then simplifying this, we get that we have negative 2 over 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 over 2. The first term simplifies to negative 1, and we can factor, or we can write the square root of negative 16 as the square root of 16 times the square root of negative 1. Square root of 16 is 4, divided by 2 is 2, and so we get that the roots are negative 1 plus or minus 2 times the square root of negative 1. And we substituted one of these two values in and did see that it was a root. Now, one thing that's becoming to be very clear is that it's annoying to always having, have to write down the square root of negative 1. Consequently, mathematicians introduced the idea of i. So i is defined as the square root of negative 1. Engineers desperately needed the square root of negative 1, but engineers use i for current. So engineers chose j to be defined as the square root of negative 1. Thus, we will now write z equals negative 1 plus 2j instead of writing either z is equal to negative 1 plus twice the square root of negative 1 or z is equal to 1, negative 1 plus the square root of negative 4. It's just clearer, more compact, and easier to understand. Now, if mathematicians ever complain about using j instead of i, all you have to say is the following. The field a plus ib is a subfield of the quaternions, and the field a plus jb is another subfield that is isometric to yours. And then you can stick out your tongue. Thus, it appears that the roots of the polynomial z squared plus 1 can be written as z is equal to plus or minus j. Similarly, the roots of the polynomial z squared plus 2z plus 5 appear to be the complex, or the numbers, z equals negative 1 plus or minus 2j. Okay, so given the definition that j squared is equal to negative 1, what is j cubed? Well, j cubed is just square, j squared times j, j squared is just equal to negative 1. Negative 1 times j is just negative j. What's j to the fourth? Well, j to the fourth can be written as j squared times j squared. Each of those are negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. So j to the fourth is 1. What's j to the 1 million and 1? Well, j to the 1 million and 1 can be written as j to the 4 times 250,000 plus 1. But from secondary school, you know that this is just j to the 4 times 250,000 times j to the 1. But j to the 4 times 250,000 is just j to the 4 all raised to the power 250,000, and j to the 1 is just j. But j to the 4th, we just saw, is 1. And 1 raised to the power 250,000 is 1. And 1 times j is j. Also note that j times negative 1 is just negative j squared, which is equal to negative times the negative of negative 1, which is just 1. Hey, that's cool. Doesn't that say the multiplicative inverse of j is negative j?
Interesting. We'll look at more into this later. Okay, let's have some more fun. Let's multiply 1 plus j times 1 plus j. So let's just square 1 plus j. Well, again, using FOIL, first we have 1 times 1. Outside, 1 times j, which is just j. Inside, j times 1, which is j. And last, j times j, which is j squared. Simplifying this, we have 1 plus 2j plus negative 1, which is just equal to 2 times j as the 1 cancels with the negative 1. Okay, so if 1 plus j squared is 2j, does this not mean that the square root of 2j is 1 plus j? All right, that seems reasonable. Yes, it is. That's by definition what a square root is. Um, okay, but wait a second. 2 is the square root, is a square root of 4, and negative 2 is a square root of 4, because negative 2 times negative 2 is also 4. So if z is the square root of another number, is not also negative z? All right, let's try this out. Let's suppose that the negative of 1 plus j is negative 1 minus j. So let's see what happens when we multiply negative 1 minus j by itself. Well, once again, using FOIL, negative 1 times negative 1 is plus 1. Negative 1 times negative j is plus j. Negative j times negative 1 is also plus j. And negative j times negative j is just negative 1 squared times j squared. Negative 1 squared is 1. So that's just leaving us with j squared. And once again, j plus j is 2j. 1 plus j squared is 0. So this leaves us again with 2j. So if 1 plus j is a square root of 2j, then negative 1 minus j is also a square root. Uh, we're probably going to have to pick one to be the principal square root, but we'll worry about that later. So in this topic, you understand where the concept of j comes from. It's simply the square root of negative 1. You also know that some polynomials do, that do not have real roots do appear to have roots if we allow us to use this imaginary value that we call j, which is the square root of negative 1. And we saw a few extra properties. Here's the references, acknowledgments, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!